Ladies and gentlemen, our guest for tonight made his debut as a novelist in 1988 with a novel that was described by critics and admirers as, as variously as a nasty little Hollywood novel, as a thoroughly up-to-date fable that maybe Kafka would have written if he'd been employed by MGM, and as a menacing psychological thriller set amid the power politics of Hollywood. It is the story of Griffin Mill, an ambitious young studio executive who, just as he seems to sense the first signals of a possible lowering of his status in the studio hierarchy, begins to receive menacing and threatening postcards from a writer whom he apparently has given somewhere in the past the treatment that is not unusual at all for writers in Hollywood. You said you'd get back to me. You didn't, the messages say ominously. And finally, the anonymous, anonymous writer announces that in the name of all the writers who have been pushed around by studio executives, I'm going to kill you. Griffin Mill is more than a little disturbed. He looks up one of the possibly hundreds of screenwriters that may be suspected of the authorship of the postcards and kills him. And as the story unravels, the disturbing thing is that Griffin Mill gets away with the crime and, although he at one point admits to feeling sorry for the writer, does not seem to care about it very much. The death of his antagonist, who, as it turns out, has not written the postcards at all, only preoccupies him in the sense that it may further threaten his status in Hollywood, just as driving the wrong car or ordering the wrong entree in the restaurants where Hollywood has its power lunches may do. Although Gordon Mill has his weak moments too, in which he wonders, is that it? Is that what it's all about? All of history, all of power, to have the head waiter's respect? Could you see the player made into a movie? Mr. Tolkien asked one of his interviewers incredulously after the novel appeared. Could you really? And yet that is, ex is exactly what happened. In the hands of Robert Altman, who in previous films like Nashville and The Wedding showed no mercy for other American institutions, the player was made into a movie with the same title, which was released last year. Mr. Tolkien wrote the screenplay. It is a bitter and extremely funny movie that seems to have the venomous message that crime pays in Hollywood, as long as it's the writer who is the victim. Schmucks with Underwoods, Jack Warner called them. Jack Warner, uh, the, uh, the, head, the former head of uh, Warner Brothers, uh, the man that um, Ronald Reagan used to refer to as the greatest man I've ever met. So, um, schmucks, the schmucks may no longer use Underwoods, but IBMs or Apple computers but their status, more often than not, has hardly been elevated. The writer is on the lowest step of the scale, and the player, novel and movie alike, brim with wonderful details that attest, that attest to this phenomenon, like secretaries who warn their new colleagues not to mingle with them, the writers, that is. Hollywood knows they are not dispensable, but wishes they were, like Griffin Mill's rival, Larry Levy, who boasts at an executive meeting that a newspaper story, any newspaper story, will be as sufficient as a script. Mr. Tolkien has some experience that led him to write the player. After working as a journalist in New York, he went to Hollywood, working on a few television series, none of which was successful. He then switched to screenplays, also unsuccessfully at first, and he knows the pitch, the snub, the telephone calls that are never returned from first-hand experience. But although he has admitted in one interview that the player started out as a realization of his own murderous impulses, he says the book is not an act of vengeance. Just as Griffin Mill, who is guilty of murder in the player, seems able to escape his feelings of guilt, Frank Gale, the protagonist of Mr. Tolkien's second novel, is not guilty of anything at all, but it is this guiltlessness, in a sense, that brings him down. In this novel, Among the Dead, that appeared this year, Frank Gale, a record shop owner with repressed ambitions of being an artist himself, tries to revive his marriage by inviting his wife and young daughter to a holiday in Mexico. There he will give his wife a carefully composed letter in which he confesses to having had an affair that is now terminated. But something happens. 
He has a last-minute lunch with his lover in which he tells her the bad news, gets stuck in dense Los Angeles traffic, and misses the plane. He calls his wife, learns that she has already found a letter, and they agree that he will take the next plane. As he waits in the airport, news comes in that the plane has crashed over San Diego. There are no survivors. What follows is a stunning stream of developments during which Gail's efforts to come to terms with what has happened are in a very oppressive way taken over by others. The airline corporation, the police, his family, lawyers and professional grief counselors want to dictate his grief and his according behavior. Upset as he is, but unable to feel his pain and consequently even more upset, he takes the train to the area of the crash where he wanders around, trying to make something of something. He finds his own suitcase among the debris, but when he tries to touch it, he is arrested for looting. In the meantime, the media sensationalize the letter that has been found near the wreckage, and he can do nothing but look on as a whole nation is wondering who wrote it and who the female lover is that is described. Among the Dead is a deeply disturbing book, but at the same time a comedy, the darkest of comedies that escapes being nothing but satire. The book has some shocking scenes, not in the least where Frank Gale is literally among the dead in the scene of the crash, but also in the morgue, where, although his brother furiously tries to prevent him, he identifies two heaps of shattered flesh as his wife and daughter. Among the dead drew praise from, among others, Faye Weldon, who noted that and I quote this because this may relate to the discussion afterward. It has all the merits of film, the accessibility, the excitement of the plot, the calculated ability to control, manipulate, and surprise an audience, the habit of tying up loose ends, the eye for detail, the ear for dialogue, and it's not quite naturalistic delivery, a briefness, a pointedness, all things often thought merely vulgar in the literary novel, but a necessary shot in the arm for literature if it's to do more than survive as a relic of pre-electronic age. Apart from being a screenwriter and a novelist, Mr. Tolkien was the director of the films The Rapture that you just saw some slides of, and more recently The New Age, subtitled as being about love, death, and shopping. We are very happy to have him here with us. He will read from Among the Dead and talk about film, literature, and America. He may ramble, he promised us, but he will get there. It is an honor and a pleasure to present Michael Tocken. Thank you, Jan. I, um, listening, I I promised myself that I wasn't going to turn Among the Dead into a movie, but after hearing Jan pitch it, I I think... uh, I think I finally heard the film that I was afraid of uh, that wasn't buried in the book. It's also a pleasure to speak to an audience that will understand, uh, speaks English better than the average high school audience in America. And, um, uh, of course, whenever Dutch authors come to America, we speak to them in their language. Um, I, I, uh, when I was invited to come here, I, um, I was very eager to come. I was here in Amsterdam when I was eight years old and again when I was 19, and the city hasn't changed in 200 years, so I, it was fun to see it. I, but I, I, I was in the middle of making my film, and, and the facts came through. What do you want to talk about? And I, I said, among the dead, cultural... I, I, well, I thought I had said I wanted to talk about among the dead and the cultural context uh, from which I wrote the novel, and then on Monday I got a fax just talking about what I was going to be doing this week, and it said, and of course you'll be talking about what you agreed to talk about, which is film and literature. And I, uh, I went into a complete panic because I thought, well, I just have a one-line answer for what's the connection between film and literature, which is it's really very thin. But um, the more I thought about it, the more I knew that there was something to say. At the same time, uh, I didn't want to give up what I, what I had originally wanted to talk about, which was um, the foundation for what I write. And uh, it was interesting seeing the rapture compared to the... The, the, the pictures from the rapture compared to the pictures of the player and I was also then thinking about the film I just finished and that the rapture was clearly the most cinematic um, movie I've written. I, I, have any of you seen the movie? Oh good, then I could 
we've won, so I could say anything about it. The best movie ever made. The best. Or, no, no. But I mean, actually, I mean, I thought with, you know, objectively or subjectively, I thought that those were really strong images in that compared to the player, I thought, well, you know, the player was a book. It was about people in rooms. And the rapture, if any of you could, you know, it's not about, it's not a Tony Curtis movie about a couple of bachelors in Miami. You know, it's a... It's, uh, it's, it's a fairly serious film about a telephone operator who be, uh, who's a swinger, who, you know, to orgies and, well, in her case, husband swapping or boyfriend swapping, not wife swapping. And um, she hears rumors that uh, there are, she gets the sense that something's going on in the culture and she's not really sure what. Uh, meanwhile, she's miserable and uh, she finds out that those people who are born-again Christians, those people who have accepted Christ into their heart are all getting the same dream at night, the dream of a pearl. And she wants that dream very badly, and she, or she wants to know more about it, and she goes to some Christians, and she says, I've got the dream. And they say, nah, tell us what you see, and she tells them what she sees. But it's obvious she hasn't had the experience. Finally, when she hits absolute bottom, uh, and she comes close to suicide, and she puts a gun to her head, and she can't pull the trigger. She then picks up. She's in a cheap motel. She picks up the Gideon Bible. Do they have the Gideon Bible here, or do you know what that is? Every hotel in America has a, uh, a Bible next to the bed, placed there by the Gideon Society. And she opens the Bible, and I've got this scene. I don't. It wasn't part one of the slides. Um, if we had any more slides going fast enough, we would have seen the movie. I could have just <laughs> talked. You know, I could have said, "Now she's saying. Now he's saying." And, um, and um, she, uh, she opens the Bible, there's this fantastic glow, and uh, the next time, and then she, then she finally sees the pearl. If this were a film school, I could tell you about how, after having spent $7,500 on trying to get a pearl properly, I finally I got a pearl for free from a, 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 a jewelry store, photographed it, and then they spun it around slowly, and that was our big special effect in the movie. But since this isn't a film school, I'm not going to talk about how we make movies. Um, actually, I will because it's much easier and I'm in the middle of one right now. And, um, and she, the, the, the next day after she sees this fantastic pearl, uh, her old boyfriend comes to her and he says, um, you've changed. What's wrong? And she says, well, I, I met someone. She says, oh, you met a new guy? And she says, well, a guy is not exactly the word I'd use for him. And she says, oh, you've fallen in love. And she said, you could love him too. And he says, oh no, you've fallen in love with a rich homosexual. And she says, no. He's, she, no, she says, no. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, Vic. He's the Son of God. So he immediately jumps off the bed and says, you've fallen in for a cult, haven't you? No, it's not a cult. It's just Jesus and, the, and love. And then he says, love, you'll get over this. And he goes away. She then marries her. I'm going through this because, it, 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 because I want to. That's why I'm telling you the story. And... She, um, uh, it's going to be at, at the Rotterdam Fist Festival. Uh, I came here on a covert mission. I talked about it with somebody yesterday, and then the Rotterdam Film Festival said we'd like it. So hopefully it'll be at Rotterdam in, in January. And now that you've heard about it, you don't, well, you could still go. And um, she winds up, and this is the imagery to explain some of the images you saw. She gets converted. She marries one of her old swinger boyfriends who had committed a murder in his past and didn't think he could ever be forgiven for it. And they raise a child together. Then the boyfriend is killed by a disgruntled employee. Now, you don't have this as a sort of a daily item in the news here, do you? I mean, it's a standard thing in America. Um, guy gets fired, goes home, gets drunk, gets a shotgun, goes to work, kills his boss. And kills four or five other people. So far, as, as far as I know, no one has ever gotten his job back that way. Um, I, it's... It doesn't look good on a resume, I don't know, you know. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't mean somebody can't yet, you know. This is a liberal society I live in. Well, he was angry enough, I, I, I didn't know he cared. And, um, and uh, this disgruntled employee business is, I mean, it's really, as I think about it, it's a big theme of mine. Anyway, um, the husband is killed, and then she starts getting more visions and she goes out to the desert with her daughter waiting for the rapture. Now, the rapture in America is, uh, I mean, every, 35 million people in America are born-again Christians. And, basic, and the, well, the movie was inspired by a bumper sticker that said, Warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. 
which means that the driver of that car sincerely believed that I should be six, at least six car lengths behind him because if God decided to come back at that moment, he'd go shooting out the roof, his car would go careening over the highway, and if I wasn't watching it, I'd rear-end him. This presents a whole interesting problem for insurance, you know. <laughs> but I don't want to get into that. I could have made the movie a comedy if I'd done that. Um, well, where did the driver go? That's what the police would say. And uh, God doesn't come. And now you see, I'm being really funny. And the next thing I have to get to is, what was that picture of the woman with a gun pointing at her child? She killed, well, she decides she and her daughter are going to, her daughter and she basically form a suicide pact. If God doesn't come, they will kill themselves and go to heaven. Uh, this was based on, a, on a, a news item I had read that sort of had some of the same, some of that, a mother who had killed her children. And I, I was trying to understand how that happens. And, um, you know, I mean, there's a certain kind of child abuse in America. I mean, I'm sure you've got some of it here, too, but it's like there's two kinds. There's a few kinds of child abuse, and there's the kind which is really, you know, someone who just so, has been so tortured by life and so abused that they, you know, they reach out to something vulnerable and, and, and then, you know, basically destroy it to annihilate themselves. But then occasionally you read about someone who has just reached such a pit of despair that the, particularly in this case, the mother for her child, that she sees no future for her anymore, and with faith, and with love, I think, is, is freeing the child from the body to go to God, whether we agree that this is good or not. I mean, this is the way people, people behave. And uh, so that's what I was making the movie about. And she shoots the child and then can't, can't bring herself to kill herself. And uh, at the end of the movie, when God finally does come back to judge the world, she refuses... I'm sorry to tell you the whole story, but it's important... I, 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 Anyway, I've gotten there. It's too late. I can't turn back. She refuses to um, apologize to God. She says, I want to know why. The Basically, she says to God, you made the world the way it is. You let this thing happen. I'm going to stand here. And given, the, uh, given a last chance to accept God and be accepted into e you know, eternal bliss with God, she stands alone, which was that, that last image. Now, when I think about the connection between film and literature, one of the things I think about is that when I wrote The Rapture, I had already written the player, the novel, not yet the screenplay. Uh, I had no intention of turning the book into a movie, but The Rapture was, for me, the most important screenplay I'd ever written. I had written 10 or 12 other scripts by that point, but when it came to The Rapture, I said, this has to be made. If they don't make this, I will give up Hollywood completely. I had written the player because I had never had a movie made. I was sick of it. And actually, I finally got a film made. It's not usually in the filmography. I don't know. It was released in Europe, but I don't know if it, what the title was. It was a skateboard movie with Christian Slater called Gleaming the Cube. Did anybody see that? It's actually not a bad film, and, it, and, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed by it because it was an original story. But um, it has a certain reputation in, in, in the States. Some people like it um, for itself, and, and Christian Slater was pretty good in it. But I, th when I wrote that, I thought, this is not what I want to do with my life. Uh, the relationship between film and literature is, is, you know, I've got a couple of definitions which I'll get to. But I, I, I wanted to do something that was meaningful, and I, didn't, and I saw that if, if Gleaming the Cube had been the best it could be, it was never going to be anything more than a decent action film. And I'd proven to myself that I could write, you know, a, some version of a Hollywood movie, but what I wanted to do was something a little bit more important. And I, and I think that one of the differences between Hollywood and, and not being in Hollywood has to be with sort of being unashamed about saying what your ambition is and even having, and being clear about having an artistic ambition and being, and at a certain point, accepting the possibility of dying by it. I mean, or, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a martyrdom of the flesh, but, but you know, being, accepting that you're going to follow ideas into, into stories or into characters that are not generic. Anyway, uh, on the other hand, selling Gleaming the Cube paid for the, the player. After I was finished the player, the, the rapture was revived. And there was a day, I came home to my office one day, and I was sure that the rapture wasn't going to get made. Uh, Sissy Spacek had been interested in the film for a little while, and then she pulled out. And I came to my office, and I just I leaned against a wall almost dizzy, and I said, that's it. Uh, you know, I saw the abyss, and I said, well, now I'm going to have to turn it into a book. And I wasn't really happy about the idea of turning it into a book. I felt like what I had in mind was really a movie. And 
And it wasn't until 15 minutes ago that I understood finally, because I'm looking at these, these slides next to each other, that I understood that I was right and that it really was a movie. I could have written a book. That story that you just heard is a, you know, I think it's a good story. And, and, and there's a way in which that story might have been a very successful novel because I could have, when the book, when the movie came out, it was really criticized. No one was indifferent to it, which is, for me, one of the, the, the saving virtues for my somewhat modest uh, place in, in the, the firmament of, a, of America where the only three writers anybody reads are John Grissom, Tom, Tom Clancy, and Anne Rice, and, and Michael Crichton. Four. One, two, three, four. Michael Crichton. Um, occasionally a couple of other people bubble through, but those are the, that's what, that's what, what reading is in America. If you get on a plane in America, you go to the beach, you know, they saw the movie, now they're reading the book again. I don't, you know, and, and so to write books in America which are serious, and again, to be, you know, to be, to be ambitious uh, and you know, somewhat even egotistical about, about the motive for, you know, for trying to write something good means that your audience is going to be very limited. And uh, the, the audience for The Rapture was limited, but The Rapture is really a movie. And uh, when I look at the player, I think, well, you know, when I wrote the player, I had no intention of turning it into a film. I, I, and it was only when David Brown, a um, the producer of Jaws, called me, and there had been a little bit of interest in it, but when the producer of Jaws called me and said, you know, this would make a good movie, I was surprised, and I was a little bit hesitant. Actually, Jan quoted a... It's one of these things which is like, in the penal colony, this interview will be inscribed on my back where I say... The rap, the play. Do you think the player can be a movie? Do you think the player can movie? And and, you know, somewhere I'm going to be punished for that. Um, there's a part of me which somewhere even regrets turning it into a film, um, not for what it has done for me, but but for the reasons that I'm holding back on letting um, Among the Dead uh, be a movie. Um, when you look at that, those are you know. I mean, if you've seen the movie, and I guess probably most of you have seen the player, you know, it's a lot of fun, but at the same time, there's something about it which is, which is static. And the images from the rapture were very dynamic because, I don't know, because I knew it was a film. When I wrote Among the Dead, I could no longer pretend to myself that a movie could not be made out of any story. I, when I finally wrote the, when I wrote the, player, the screenplay for the player, my arrangement with the producer was at first that he would hire another writer to write the script because I thought it was impossible and I didn't want to fail at something I'd already succeeded at. It That seemed like the stupidest thing I could do with my life. You know, I was ha- Here I was, and the player is this great thing in my life, and then to walk away saying, I can't write the player. You know, it, would be, it was just a... T- I was a I was, so I said, well, we'll let somebody else do it. And then I said, but if he screws up the first draft... Then I'll write the second draft. And I thought, I had, I thought, I'll let somebody else fuck up. I'll let somebody else you know, crack his head against the, the structure of the book. And then once it's laid out, then it'll be easier for me to go in and just kind of you know, do this and do that. It took about six weeks and the script was done. I did it myself. I mean, I, I, we finally said, well, look, if you're going to write the second draft, you might as well write the first one. Meaning, then we'll fire you and get another writer. And, and um, I... I was astonished and disturbed by how quickly the book translated. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I, how I, I can explain this, but I thought I had written something that was unique. And it turned out that all I had done was written a story. And that a story can transcend its form. And that if you really want to do something unique, you know, you have to write Leaves of Grass or Howl or... You know, or, or Paterson, um, Leaves of Graf is Whitman, Howell, of course, is Ginsburg, and Paterson. How, is is uh, William Carlos Williams popular in, in Dutch? Or have you read him in English? William Carlos Williams, go to a bookstore and read him. He's one of the three or four great poets in American literature. He's just fantastic. In fact, I'll stay here. I'm sure the bookstore is still open. You all come back and we'll read Williams together. Um, and, uh, and these are my heroes. I mean, I, I think the poets... The poets are my heroes more than most novelists or the American poets are. So I, when I wrote Among the Dead, I could not pretend to myself that I wasn't writing something which could be a movie. But I didn't want to write a movie. And I wanted to, because there were just, 
there were things in this, in this book that I really, I really, I, I, first of all, I really like writing books, or I've liked writing, I, I, I've enjoyed writing the two novels. Um, there's something very peaceful about writing a book when you're into it. There's something about a way a novel organizes your life. There's something about, um, there's a certain sort of pleasure in just being in yourself. There's a, the license to read and being in the movies, and this is a connection between film and literature, and I know it's sort of, I mean, it, it's practical, but the practical or the economic reasons are sometimes the most interesting. And the practical experience of being able to read and write during the day is a tremendous luxury. And um, in, in, you know, when you're making a movie, I've just, uh, one of the reasons I, I, I had forgotten what I was going to talk about tonight was that for the last 16 months, I've been working every day, all day on one film. And um, last night, I, I got about 10 hours sleep, which is the best night's sleep I've had in, in, in a year and a half. And, um, you know, it's like, it's like the movie is sort of over, and, I'm, and, and I can get back to, to reading and, and books and, and, and thinking about books. But at the same time, I think Among the Dead would, and in listening to Jan, and, and then thinking, looking, looking at the images over there, and thinking about the sort of images that I, that I come up with, I think Among the Dead, because it, it's about a plane crash, which is immediately visual. It's about a man searching through the rubble, which is great. It's about this scene with, uh, where, you know, I hadn't even realized, I mean, the title, I'd used it so um, ironically. Uh, I meant, you know, sort of the, the dead being the living in America right now. And... Um, at the same time, I thought, well, here I am. I've got this scene with a huge warehouse, a, a, a freezing cold, uh, cold storage warehouse filled with hundreds of caskets and robots moving body parts around. And I thought, God, that's a movie. And, and, I, and, and I don't know. I mean, I, this is one of these open-ended questions, I think, uh, that anybody who's written a book has to ask himself you know, at a certain point. What... Why not making it? Why not turn a book into a movie? Um, again, a, the economic relationship between literature and film. Because I refused to sell Among the Dead to the movies, I got less money for paperback sales, and uh, not only less money for foreign rights, but fewer territories interested in the book. Because since I wrote the player and am now film identified, by not by not turning this into a commodity which can be, you know, eventually wind up in, a, in, in the video store, uh, I've diminished its, its possibility to make an impact on the culture. And, um, and I, you know, I mean, I, I, at the same time, I think that, that writers should have, I don't want to say writers have an obligation, that's not fair, but I felt that I really wanted to give those who like the book the chance to have the experience of a book, the, have an experience which was private. Um, uh, you know, it's one of, the, one of the curious things about movies is that I, I think we all, when a movie doesn't do well commercially and we go to see it, but we love it, uh, I, you know, I mean, I think we can still fall in love with a movie that nobody else liked. But I think there, when I look back on the 70s and I think about the movies that I the American movies that I loved in the 1970s. There was an incredible pleasure about going to see Apocalypse Now, stoned out of my mind with 500 other people who were stoned out of their minds, with a line of people who were stoned out of their minds behind us, going to see this fantastic movie, filled, everybody saw it, everybody talked about it. You went back to see it twice, or The Godfathers, or Chinatown, or Shampoo, or The Last Detail, or... You know, um, I mean, the, the great movies of the 70s and that, or even Star Wars and Jaws, um, you know, to some degree. Uh, and then by the 1980s to find that American movies had really lost their art or their genius and were turning into retreads. And that also at the same time, well, so there was no, there, you, you lost the pleasure of going to, the, going to see a, mass, a massively successful film, which was also great. And then, um, and then literature also had sort of broken apart. And, and I just feel like it's almost for sort of spiritual reasons, at least for now, it's a good thing to allow people, to allow readers a chance to have, to share with maybe only 15,000 or 20,000 other people a chance to have this experience which only they have. Because a, a, a film which... I don't know. The movies are so complicated right now. I don't want to go off on this tangent. There's something I wanted to read. But 
the movies are in terrible shape. And I, I don't think that, that, I don't want to say the literature is in terrible shape, but the last, well, I, I don't know what it's like here, but I, I was talking about this with a friend a couple of days ago. I cannot remember the last time I was with a group of six people at a, say, as if I say eight, then it wouldn't even work but six people at a dinner table where everyone at the table had read the same good, no, good new novel and could talk about it. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's a strange thing, you know. It's like everybody reads, but everybody reads something else. Everybody reads something, you know, something different. When, when, when Among the Dead came out, um, there were four or five other books that it, that it came out with at the same time. And uh, there was a T.C. Boyle, does, is um, T. Corgason Boyle published here? Uh, Boyle, a Steve Erickson novel, Arc DX, um, The Virgin Suicides, and a couple of other books. And we all, you know, the spring books. And, I don't know, without keeping score, I got, I don't know, I mean, I got some really good reviews. And I got a couple of reviews that should have broken the book apart. All of us got really good reviews here and there. But none of the books took off in any in any you know, in, in any big way, and they just sort of got swamped. And I think, well, there's a lot of reasons, and I think that the that partly that's because the audience has other things. Because, well, for one thing, the New York Times Sunday Book Review reviews, let's say, 15 or 20 nonfiction books and then three or four novels. Now, I don't know what the percentage is here, but the novel is really, the novel has been, or the novelist is not really, isn't taken seriously anymore. The films have taken over, the films have taken over, and for, for reasons which I may wind up regretting someday, I held off on turning this because I just wanted to protect it from, I wanted to protect it from the movies. Now, I, there was something else I wanted to, to do tonight, I remember I started talking, I saying I wanted to talk about the cultural context of, uh, uh, of um, where my work comes from, because it's all, you know, it's all pretty violent, and, and this, the, the, among the dead, so the rapture has the disgruntled employee who kills somebody. The player has the writer who is, in a sense, mad at the boss, so he wants to kill somebody. And um, among the dead, the plane crash is caused by, a, by an employee who was fired. And it's actually based on a, it was based on a real case. Um, a, guy got, a guy sneaked a gun onto a plane, and, and um, he had been through, he'd gotten around airport security because he had a badge that, you know, he hadn't, they hadn't taken his badge yet, his, his security badge away. And he got on a plane and, and uh, wrote a note to his boss who was on the flight. He knew the guy was going to be on the plane saying, uh, you showed me no mercy. I'm going to show you no mercy. It's funny how it ends, ends isn't it, which I reproduced in the book. And then he uh, shot the guy on the plane. And then the stewardess, the flight attendant, <laughs> well, a gun on the plane, so she went to the, the pilot and said, we have a problem, and that, that the flight recorder heard the stewardess coming in, you know, this was on the tape, that they recovered from the plane. The stewardess said, we have a problem. Then this guy said, I'm the problem, and then shot up the cockpit, and the plane went into the ground. Um, and there's a description in the book of uh, what, the, what the bodies were like in the, in the plane, which I also, I'm not going to give this to you because it's really disgusting. And uh, I'm going to press the limits of what's disgusting tonight, but uh, I don't want to go that far. And um, uh, I probably lost some of you with a happy film about a mother, not a happy, about a picture of the mother who shoots her child. Um, one of the th reasons I set the book in San Diego was that San Diego is a very strange place. And I, um, I want to read something to you. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what it is, and then I'm going to read something else, and then I'm going to read from the book. How much time do we have? Because I'm going much, I'm doing better than I thought I was going to. <laughs> We're okay? Good. All right. And then I'll finally get to Among the Dead, and then, I don't know, Jan can ask questions, and you can, and, you know, it'll be four in the morning, and we'll be fine. Um, oh, that was uh, just a, uh, um, Bruce Springsteen was in Los Angeles once, and he gives these very long concerts, and uh, uh, there were some, uh, there was a disc jockey who, uh, who at five in the morning, got on the radio and said, and he's still playing, and he's opened the doors. And thousands of people at five or four in the morning drove down to the hall where he was playing. Of course, he'd stopped playing three hours before. <laughs> they were dying to get in. Um, all right, I'm going to read something. I, 
how do I set this up so that I can shock you? Um, it's a piece of a short story, and I'll summarize what's, uh, what's in the way. Um, the, uh, it's about a, a character named Natas, a bishop. And um, if you're clever and quick, you know that Natas spelled backwards is Satan, so it's Bishop of Satan. And he despises the human race, and uh, I'll quote the, quote the He didn't feel right at night unless he thought about killing. And according to the story, now I'll read the story. In the day, everything was fine. He could do his job down at the service station. He could stomach food sometimes, and he could even pretend to like people and talk to them. That got a little easier with time. Even in the day, it was difficult to stomach their weaknesses, but he managed. At night, though, that is when the demons came out to play. He gave up on sleep years ago. He'd go out and jog. He worked out at night. Uh, Natas considers beating up an old man at a bar, but decides instead to commit mass murder to clear his depression. He had to grab life. He had to face the beast and be a warrior. He couldn't get lost like them. His time was now. He would die if that's what it took. A glorious death early would be better. He had to grab society and shake them, just let them know that there will be a death and they had to take life more seriously than this. At one point, Natas loads his shotgun and starts looking for a place to kill people. God, how many times had he thought about this. At night, it was the last thought he had, the one that put him to sleep. In fact, he didn't feel right at night unless he thought about killing. Eventually, Natas drives his 1967 Camaro uh, to a fast food restaurant. Slowly, he walked the eternity to the door, a weight pressed against his soul. It was fear. That's what it was about. He knew that is what this life was ruled by. This is what he had to fight. He had to face the beast and be a warrior. All this life, he hated people for not fighting the beast. Natas kills the first man he encounters uh, and then starts shooting wildly. Dis detesting their weakness, Natas cocked the shotgun again and went right up to the lady. He put the gun to the lady's face and pulled back the trigger. The pellets hit her face. He put all four shots in the crowd. About six people fell. He methodically loaded the gun and shot at the crowd again. They just stood there like rabbits and took the shotgun blast. They had no place to run, and they just stood there shivering with fright. With police closing in, Natas walks out of the restaurant carnage. Slowly, Natas raised his gun up and put it in his mouth. The voice stopped. Without a second of hesitation, Natas found the end. He pulled the trigger. Now, before I say any more, I'm just, does anybody think that's good? It's too, I'm sorry. Was I reading too fast? Oh, do I have to slow down? Am I talking too fast for you? All right, so you sit closer and I'll talk slowly. Um, well, the person who wrote that, they found that story in the writing class of a man named, what's his name? James M. Bouquet. James M. Bouquet was, a, was raised uh, in a fundamentalist Christian family in San Diego. His uh, father owns a, uh, a, a store that sells equipment for saws, for lawnmowers and, and, and chainsaws. And his mother runs a daycare center. They have a big house. Um, the parents said that their son had recently been undergoing professional Christian psychotherapy for depression, but seemed improved of late. What snapped, I don't know, Janet said, but something snapped because that was not our Jimmy. He wasn't violent. He was just very quiet. He'd do a lot of writing in his room. Um, what this guy did was, after he wrote that story, he got a shotgun, he went to a, uh, um, a health club, and um, he uh, shot four people and then killed himself. That's California. There was another mass murder in California about in, in a killing like that in San Diego a week later. That's where I live. It's a very strange place. And in trying to find some way to fit these kinds of stories into film or into literature instead of just writing genre, it's very difficult to, to keep one. I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, if I have a sort of sense of humor, if I'm sort of sarcastic about all of it, I mean, at a certain point, it's like, it's like one has to say, what is, the, what is your response? What, what, is your, what, is the respo what, what response are you supposed to have? Um, you know, uh, uh, when, when Susan Sontag, I gather Sontag spoke here and uh, a couple of weeks ago or last month, uh, I, I got in, I had a complicated response to something Sontag did. She, you know, she went to Sarajevo and put on a production of Waiting for Godot. And when I heard that she did this, my first response, and I don't, I'm not saying it's the right response or that it was a, a sign of that I'm, I, don't, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily good of me to have had this response. My first response was really quite sarcastic. 
And I said, well, you know, I mean, why didn't she take the good, the bad, and the ugly and show them that, you know? I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, 1950s modernism, you know, it's like such a predictable cliche, you know? The Upper East Side New York intellectual, the Upper West Side New York intellectual taking, you know, Parisian existentialism to the intellectuals of Sarajevo, and, and you know, why not show them a good violent movie, and, you know, which is also you know, which also has a moral point about a society that's falling apart and, and offers its own vision of how to escape it or not to escape it. Um, but then, I don't know, then actually, and again, this was another one of my responses, and all of this is about why I think ultimately certain things are better. Right now I feel like I'm, I'm fighting the cinema because my, my preoccupation seems to be more literary because I'm trying to deal with levels of ambivalence which are really hard to get into a film. Um, cinema is very, at least, I'm, at least at the level at which I'm working now, because I'm really, I've only made two movies and, and uh, I've only directed two films. And the 73 days of shooting that I've had total on the two films is all the time I've ever had behind a camera. And um, the, uh, the, my other, when I, anyway, I heard uh, a few weeks later after I'd been on my ramp, tirade, not rampage, that's in San Diego, my tirade against, uh, against Sontag. I heard something on the radio. There was a, uh, uh, an, ex an exhibition of Annie Leibovitz's photographs in Sarajevo, and they, someone had gone with a tape recorder. And, you know, you heard the, 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 the string quartet in the background, and you could hear the, you know, they, they got the wine being poured and the clink of the plastic glasses and the hub of the voices. And, and I thought, well, it was okay for her to bring Godot there. It was fine, you know. I mean, it was like the sort of, you know, I could feel the pretension of the crowd not unlike us. And I would have gotten a laugh in America on that one. <laughs> I've got to slow down. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I thought, it's fair, you know, there's different audiences. If I, you know, I, the audience, in fact, my idea for where I got this notion of showing the good, the bad, and the ugly was that I'd once heard about a, uh, um, someone gone down to the Yucatan in Mexico along near the Guatemalan border where the Mayans are, live in little villages and it's incredibly poor down there. And they'd seen a couple of Indians with a truck and a projector and a, gener and a generator and they had a, a terribly scratched 16 millimeter print of the good, the bad, and the ugly and they were taking it around from village to village and putting it up against a wall and showing the film. And, and I thought, you know, Sontag's direction of Godot might not work down there, but it also might work brilliantly. But, but that, you know, these are audiences have, if I have any theme now, I, I think it has to do with that, this notion somehow of, of trying to resist the total culture or, the, or the, the, uh, the impulse to want a total culture, the, want, the impulse to want to impose your notion of, uh, of, of culture. I think Sontag was great to have gone to Sarajevo. When she said that when she was in Sarajevo, she felt that's real life, I, that was a, that, at that point I, I felt that that was worth criticizing because that's aestheticizing war and it's easy for someone with a round trip ticket from New York to say that's real life. I think that anybody in Sarajevo would take the most boring suburb not San Diego because that's too violent there, but the most boring suburb in America over, uh, you know, over 15 minutes of dodging shells for water, you know, and, and, and I, so that wasn't right. Now, something else I wanted to read. Do you mind if I just meander a little bit or does all of this scan? Maybe I'll read a bit from Among the Dead. How's that? Is that right? Oh, let me do that. Okay. How are we doing on time? I just want to, Okay. She'll save that until 2 in the morning. They're going to keep me going It's because uh, I didn't put this on my watch up. Um, one of the, this is one of these scenes which I think is, is really why, which would be very hard to put in a movie. I, I think one of the, the differences, well, I, when I just fin finishing the film that I, that I just shot, I, I went to the set with about 125 pages but by the time we were finished, in, finished editing the film, the movie was now, re the script is really 93 pages long. And the same thing happened with The Rapture and the same thing happened with The Player. Um, all screenplays get cut a lot and they get cut because they're too long because a movie really is a series of little impressions uh, linked emotionally and linked 
dramatically in terms of progression of plot, but repeti movies cannot stand repetition. You cannot say something twice in a movie. Um, it doesn't usually, usually it doesn't work. And you can't kind of work in and around an idea. You have to say, that's it, whatever that is. Uh, it can be a big idea, it can be a little idea, but it has to be very clear. Um, but the wonderful thing about books is that as long as the writer is weaving the spell properly, you know, the writer can take you anywhere. And uh, if you need to put it down or think about it or go back a few pages to absorb it, I mean, that's how we all read. We all read the same way, which is not linearly, but, you know, sort of going back and forth. The way we treat the video cassette now, it's interesting that the movies used to be an experience which you could have only in one way, which was through time and at one, in one, you know, set experience. So that the movie was always the same thing for everybody. Um, but now that I rent tapes, I can't remember, just as I can't remember the last time I had dinner with six people who talked about the same book, I can't remember the last time I ever sat down and watched a movie without pausing or without rewinding. So our relationship to books to movies as we've brought them at home, has become something like our relationship to literature, which has an effect on well, books anyway, not literature, not only literature. Um, but our relationship to movies now is uh, at home we can take control over them, um, which is just, I don't know, it's just one of the peculiarities of the modern era. Anyway, so here's something which I think would be, which goes in and out of, of uh, a scene that's filmable. Um, Frank Gale has a brother named Lowell, and I don't think I need to say too much about him, but the, this plane has, cra a plane has crashed and Frank has gone to uh, a hotel in Los Angeles near the airport where um, uh, the airline has gathered all the, 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 they want to call them the survivors of the crash, but it's not the survivors, it's just the relatives and friends of the dead um, to help them and to basically to counsel them and also to make sure that lawyers don't get to them too quickly so that they'll sue. And um, Lowell, Frank's brother, is a successful businessman and a man who takes charge. And he, um, he's gotten a little closer to one of the airline supervisors. Uh, and so the supervisor has dropped his professional facade. And he says to Frank and to, to, to his brother, I'm sorry to have to speak about well, they talk about the crash in the bodies. And he says, I'm sorry to have to speak about things, these, these things so directly, but I figure you don't want me to pull the punches. And frankly, I appreciate that. A lot of people, and this isn't to say that they're not entitled to their feelings, but a lot of people in this room don't want you to say what has to be said. They want you to almost say it. They want you to give them a taste of what you really mean. And then they want you to back down and apologize for going even that far. But I say, if it happened in a certain way, you're obliged to say that's the way it happened. Frank, that's the hero of the book, saw Dockery, the one who was just speaking, saw Dockery win respect from Lowell for this, for separating Frank and Lowell from the others, all the other mourners in the room. And this was something he did with everybody, take them all into his confidence, show them all how much he tried. Oh, and was this something he did with everyone? take them all into his confidence, show them all how much he treated them. While Dockery was talking, one of the men cruising the tables came to his side and put a hand on his shoulder. Dockery introduced him. Mr. Gale, I'd like you to meet Dale Beltran. Dale is one of our grief counselors. This is a real job that people have. If you don't mind, I think it would be good to talk to him. Frank Gale, said Frank, and this is my brother, Lowell. Dale Beltran, he said. Are you a psychologist? asked Lowell. Yes, said Beltran. Frank hated the way he looked. His hair was too long for his curls, and the effect of suspended youth with his soft face and body bothered Frank terribly. Why am I threatened by this guy? Frank asked himself, but he had no answer. Do you mind if I chat a bit? It would be a good idea, said Dockery. Sure, said Frank. Beltran sat down. How do you feel? He asked. Not great. Like you can't believe it's really happened? I believe it. Intellectually, yes, but emotionally? I don't know. Well, Mr. Gale, he paused, and Frank knew why. He wanted Frank's permission to, say his, to use his first name. Frank. Frank, 
there are a few stages of grief, and I wanted to share them with you, to help you get through them so you won't feel so alone. The first is denial. This is what they do in America. I'm going to act it up. The first is denial, which is what you're going through now. And with that, you'll feel alone. That's the isolation stage. Then comes anger, and that's a hard one. After that, well, you'll feel pretty low. The experts like to call that the depression phrase. In America, people do this. They say, the depression phrase. It's like, bang! The hands are up. You can do it. Um, I'd prefer to call that the period of sadness. And then, finally, after the storm, you'll make peace with that. And that's acceptance. Oh, and that's acceptance. And then what, asked Frank? Hope. That's the one that seems so far away, said Ed Dockery, and that's the one we have to live for. Good luck, said Del Beltran. I'll talk to you again. He left, them, <laughs> he, he left them with a round of handshakes and then walked away and introduced himself to the copper-haired woman, which is another story. It was only 8.30. No, you know, I'm going to stop because I've got something better to read, and it's connected to this. It relates to this. To prove that I'm not making any of this up, I could go on. Forget what I was going to say. That's a good scene. It'd be fine in a movie. It works either way. How many of you know about the Menendez trial in California? One, two, three, four, five. All right. Eric and Lyle Menendez are 19 and 21, and um, they killed their mother and father. Their father. Now people are, okay, all right. They killed their mom and dad. Well, that's colloquial. They killed their mother and father. And um, they, 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 got away, they, got away, they were almost getting away with it. It was uh, about a year before they were arrested. Um, a couple of things tripped them up. One of them was that while they were being, um, one of them was staying at a cousin's house, and the police, just as they were trying to follow leads, the man, the father was a wealthy businessman worth $14 million, and there was a possibility. He was, he was a Cuban. There was a possibility. They thought maybe the anti-Castro people had killed him or the pro-Castro people had killed him. There was, a, there was some rumor that he'd been involved with the drug mafia or he was in the record business. And there was a, you know, they were, it was a serious crime. And it you know, shocked Beverly Hills. And uh, the, um, the police were there. One of the brothers was staying at this cousin's house. And the police were there. And they were just you know, asking them questions. And they said, it must have been awful. And they said, oh, yeah. The smoke, I'll never get a, the, the, when we got back into the house, the room was filled with smoke. I'll never, I'll never, get, a, I'll never get that sight, that smell out of my, out of my, out of my nose. And uh, the police thought, well, the smoke from a gunshot, from shotguns, would dissipate, would disappear in about five minutes. And the brothers had said they came back 40 minutes after the crime. So how did they know the smoke? So that was like, that's like dust, you know, if the brothers had only read Dostoevsky, they could have done, you know, they would have done a, they would have gotten away with it or not done it, one or the other. Um, it just depends on your perspective, you know, it's like, uh, anyway. Um, so, the brothers, in their grief, because they had done this terrible thing and they were living with this Dostoevsky in grief, obviously, this guilt, uh, went to a psychotherapist in California for help. And what I, I think is so brilliant about the whole case is that the therapist uh, is, is the nature of the therapist they went to see. Um, and I'm going to read a bit of the, the transcript of this case because it's so great. And, you know, you can read, you can buy the book and you can see the movie, but, you know, I came here with something precious. And the shrink, a little background on Dr. Ozeal, uh, Jer- L. Jerome Ozeal, which is already a terrible name. I mean, if I wrote a character name, Ozeal, is a char- it's, like, it's like Dickensian, and it's, it's complete. And, um, and Dr. Ozeal, well, Dr. Ozeal was counseling them for a while, and when he found out that they had killed their parents, he started concocting, now this is all conjecture now, and if I were in America, he'd probably sue me for slander, but I don't know, so we won't broadcast this. But it seemed clear to those of us who were following the case, and there's suggestions of it, that he was trying to take advantage of the possibility that they were going to, of the, of the fact they were going to inherit a lot of money. And he had his mistress eavesdropping on the sessions once they confessed, because he was afraid maybe they were going to kill him. 
his mistress didn't want to do this, but he had been working some kind of, you know, the Star Trek Vulcan mind control. He had been hypnotizing her. He had done this with all of his girlfriends. He was married. Um, and in fact, one of his girlfriends, was this mistress was living in the house with him. But he had some kind of like Manchurian candidate thing going. And, and in fact, they, one of the girlfriends was so afraid of him that she had, that she, oh, in fact, this girlfriend was so afraid of him that she had taped a phone conversation. Everybody's taping. She had taped a phone conversation in which she said, I'm scared. I don't know. I want to go to the police. And, and, and he said, don't go to the police. And, no, I'm afraid of going to the police. And then he had his code word with her, which was, I've forgotten it, but let's say it was um, pencil. Pencil, Diane. Uh, well, I'm afraid of going to the pencil, Diane. I'm going to go to pencil. Yes, Jerome. Remember pencil? And it was like he got the word, and you could hear it on the tape. And she calmed down, and he soothed her, and she, you know, she agreed not to go to the police. But he worked it out with her that he would tape, tape this. He, they had confessed once, and now he wanted to get it on tape in his office, but just to protect himself in case they pulled a gun on him, he wanted her outside. So... This is the shrink, and then oh, the, the nobody, the, the defense did not want this in court. It was finally played in court a couple of weeks ago, and it was printed in the paper. Oh, and Eric and Lyle are there. Why did your dad have to die? I mean, I know for your mom why she had to die. How about for the two of you? What, what, it's clear to me how much he totally controlled the two of you and, and treating you as if you were disappointments. Lyle, who was the controlling brother. But I still don't think it had anything to do with killing him. It had nothing to do with us. It had to do with me realizing a number of things that all culminated, and it was just a question of Eric and I getting together and somebody bringing it up and us realizing the value in it. Now, Eric, according to the, the two brothers in court, had been sexually abused by his father from the time he was four years old until he was 18, and the brothers in court were saying that they killed their parents because they were sure that their parents were just about to kill them, any moment. The fact that the parents were sitting in front of a television in their night clothes, eating vanilla pudding and straw and blueberries, you know, the court said, what were they going to do? Kill you with the blueberries? The, the prosecutor said, what were they going to do? Shoot the blueberries at you with a spoon? And the brothers said, well, you had to be there. You know, it's like everybody says, you know, America is this peaceful country, but if you add up the number of murders a year, you know, we're, we're as violent as any country in the, I mean, it's like a war going on every day. Anyway, um, so where was I? And, all right, that, uh, the value in it, uh, which was my father had a dream now of going into politics, and that my mother would not be able to handle that. She had expressed over and over again how that would be the worst thing in the world for their relationship. He would, what she wanted was for him to get away from this business and, and dictatorship life and just sort of retire with her and, and get to know her. If he went into politics, she would again be that shell of a showcase for him and, and he would be boom, 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 very busy, be very busy. That would be his new love, politics, instead of business, instead of her. Ozil, the shrink, instead of an affair. The brothers were telling the shrink that they killed him because he had been having an affair and they wanted to defend their mother. And Oh, the other thing they said was she really wanted to commit suicide, but she was afraid to, so we helped her commit suicide. <laughs> you be the jury. Instead of an affair, Lyle, like he had given up women and taken up politics. It was his new affair. He needed passion in his life. Very passionate man, but, but not with her. Uh, Eric, the other brother. This is the one who says he was abused. I, he was somebody that I loved and almost had no choice to do what I did, and I hate myself for doing it, and I, and I understand why it was done, but I somehow in my mind, I, I can't rationalize it. And then he started crying, because, because the love that I had for him and my mother, it's more difficult because of my mother, because I realize what an amazing tragedy her life was compared to what it could have been because of my father. And I hate him for that. And I love him, and it's... It's something that, uh, it's way beyond control. And Ozil, what was beyond control? That you had to kill him? <laughs> Eric, eventually it had to happen. It was basically ruining my life, and I guess Lyle's. And, and, and he was putting my mother through torture. Now, when this tape was played in court, the defense hired uh, an expert psychologist to claim that every time 
they say the word mother, they really meant brother because it all had to do with self-defense. If they killed their father because of the way he was treating their mother, that's a hard thing to justify. So they tried something else, and this is the specter saying, don't listen to the tape. Anyway, um, I think it's funny. Um, that my mother through torture, Ozeal. Why don't you, Eric, can you turn toward Lyle and tell him what you feel? You can do it, Eric. There's no reason to. Ozeal, yeah, there's a lot of reasons. Come on. What this is all about is you not having done this in vain, but for, for you really to get to the place where you can deal with your feelings and, and not be a prisoner of whatever happened. And so, yeah, there's a reason to it. Do you love Lyle? Eric. Yeah. Ozeal, turn your chair and face him. Eric, I'd rather n- I, I feel uncomfortable. I, I'd rather not. Ozeal, Eric, wait a minute. Wait, okay, what am I here for? Eric, it seems like I can say it to almost anyone else except for my family. Ozeal, uh, uh, Lyle, I think, I think the reluctance stems from a pride issue. Ozeal, do you love him? Lyle, yeah, I, I love Eric very much. Ozeal, okay, can you turn a little more towards him? <laughs> come on, oh God, come on. You can do this. It says he was laughing, so I said, you can do this. Lyle, we hate that hugging shit, by the way. We <laughs> fucking hate that. You know what? This is the shrink. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> what we're really tr- doing is trying to, to help you help you undo what happened. Remember what happened? They killed their mother and father. One of the things one of the brothers did was follow the mother around the room as she was crawling on the floor, go outside, reload, put the shotgun against her face, and pull the trigger again. So again, it gets to the the short story about shooting people with the pellets and getting the gun close to them. That's this California fantasy of getting close with the gun. Because we hate that hugging, that, that hugging stuff. We just fucking hate it. So... You know what? I don't care. What you're really trying to do is to help you undo what happened and help you create what never got created so that, you know, what happened happened for a reason and that you can now create something between the two of you that that is supposed to be there to begin with because you're what we have left. Uh, You're your family now. Lyle, I still think mom's death was a suicide because, you know, I'm... Anyway, it goes through this. I just want to get to the next thing because I'm... Anyway. Um... Uh, honestly, uh, Lyle, honestly, I never thought it would happen. Even though I had thought about it, I, it, was, it, was, it was done so quickly and so sort of callously almost because, all, one, if, if we thought about it too much, the feelings of not having your parents around and so on would get in the way of what was more important, which was helping your mother, really. And it was just a meeting of the minds. The time is now. L- Ozeal, uh-huh. <laughs> Lyle, or you put that, oh, uh-huh, I'm sure he was doing yeah, yeah, more, more, because Lyle Vince is more. I mean, I mean, I remember when we had to go down wherever to take care of an important issue concerning, uh, that means like getting the guns, and Eric said, I can't do it, I, I've got to practice because I have a tennis tournament coming up. And he was completely blocking out, meaning we had a plan to kill our parents, and he's like, he wants to play tennis? I mean, you know, where's his priority? I, I couldn't even tell him, but I was feeling... He doesn't realize, Lyle was the smarter one, he doesn't realize the impact of what he's doing. He wants to take care of this problem, and he wants to take care of this problem, shoot mom and dad, and wish his life was the same. And he still had normal parents, but he could never have. He doesn't realize that that's what he's doing. There will be no more tournaments like that. There's going to be no more. All the... All the little good things that are in our relationship. And I think one of the big, biggest pains he has is that you miss just having these people, his mother and father. You miss just having these people around. I mean, I miss not having my dog around, if I can make a gross analogy. Ozeal, uh huh. <laughs> so I don't know, that's California. I mean, I, 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 and that's something about the relationship between books and movies, which is. How oh, are we almost done? You thinking anymore? I mean, I can keep going, but. But one of, what? Okay. What I wanted to say was that in Among the Dead, well, in the player, Griffin wonders, would this be a movie? 
And he casts it a little bit, and I think he says it's going to be a, probably a television movie. You know, the difference between features and TV, that, uh, the features and TV movies. Television movies are always sensational, and they're always hot off the headlines, and they're never as good as features. They're done in short time with bad talent, and, or lesser talent. And in Among the Dead, because I was just basically having fun, my, my character asks himself the same question, is this story going to become, is, am I going to become famous now for the reasons that, you know, you should read the book or, you know, the reasons that, the, for, anyway. And he says, no, it's a TV movie. I think, he says, Among the Dead is a TV movie. It's too banal, it's too, it's too sensational and banal at the same time. And um, because he doesn't have the, I mean, it's, well, anyway, it's sensational and banal. The Menendez trial, if I were going to make a movie of it, First of all, I, I would be much more, much more fun to do as a movie than as a book because of a scene like this. It would just be a, an incredible amount of fun to direct that scene. I, tonight, I think I'm ready to play Ozil. And, <laughs> and, but somebody beat me to it. It's going to be on TV. Anyway, um, thank you. I, I mean, I'm ready for questions. I'll have fun. We'll, uh, this is not the end of anything. We'll just uh, be over here in a minute. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Michael, Tolkien, and Jan Donkers. We'll have a short intermission, 15 minutes. Mr. Tolkien will sign books. He'll be seated here on stage, if you like. You can have your book signed and talk to him. Good evening. Excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, second part of the evening. Um, I had prepared some questions, uh, but maybe it's better to start with some questions relating to Michael's talk. And uh, I've had a few questions in writing that are that more that's one or two of them uh, relate to what I was wanting to ask about um, the things you mentioned about well, wh what you called the cultural landscape, no, the cultural relationship, the cultural l landscape in which your work. Um, I, I don't remember what I said. I was channeling. <laughs> I was channeling Jerry Lewis. <laughs> I, I don't know. Who was that? I, just, I had a whole notes. I had things I had written, and I never said. Anyway, okay. Um, the question is about the cultural landscape. I'll, I'll mention two questions in writing, and then I'll get on with some of my own. Dear Mr. Torgan, first of all, I'd like to say I very much enjoyed your lecture, but I'd like to ask you if, if you have any explanation for this bizarre society of yours. And... Relating to that, as an American, is the, which is the letter, the, the, the question writer, I agree that American cities and life provide endless material to criticize and satire. But, don't you, but do you ever feel an obligation to promote some of the good qualities of America? Um, I could really take the second part of the question and attack it. And I, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I would have attacked it. But the answer now is, it's a difficult one that's written. I, I could be, you know, someone out there saying, well, that was my question. That was <laughs> uh, well, he's talking to me, but he doesn't know which one I am. In America, he's supposed There's to... There's the hand. There's the hand. Okay, good. Uh -huh. See, in America, you're supposed to meet your accuser. <laughs> um, no secret trials. Um, the, uh, uh, yes, and I, but I don't think... I don't know whether it's necessarily, well, I was going to say, right now I don't feel an obligation to represent what's good in the society, but I'm really interested in, I would like to write something that could be inspiring, but by my own terms. And I don't, I can't even tell you exactly what that is right now. Um, after uh, Among the Dead comes out, I, don't know, I was saying this to Jan earlier. I, I feel like I've come to the end of a cycle, uh, and I would, I'm sort of stating this publicly, almost as a way of like taking an oath in front of myself, and that is that I don't really think I should repeat what I've done. You know, if I've had a, a dis if I've had a, an angry employee in most of my books, or or the death of children in in things I've done. In most of my books, and almost everything I've done lately, then I, I, 
I could keep doing it. Um, one of my favorite writers is Patricia Highsmith, and she's basically got three stories, three or four stories, and she's written about 18 novels and 70 or you know, 50 or 60 short stories. And she keeps trying, the, you know, one book, a man is eaten by 100 snails, and one book, a man is eaten by one giant snail. And, and I, I drew a certain inspiration from that, because when you're writing and you come to a, an idea and you realize you had that idea before, you can't pretend that you didn't have it, which means that you have to say, why am I having this? What does this mean? And how can I ignore now, now that I've got it, how can I accept the idea and then go on with it and not worry about repeating myself? But at the same time, I'm interested in, um, I'm interested for myself in, in how, in creating a character who could, in creating a character who's a good person, you know, without being a, a, without being a falsely idealized saint, but someone who's a good person. And as for picturing this as society, well, why is the society, why is America the way it was? Is that the question? Mm, an explanation no, that wasn't yeah, yeah, for the viciousness of, of the viciousness of an explanation for this bizarre society. Yeah. It's a it's a tall order that question. Again, you know, I just want to say it's the fluoride in the water, <laughs> but I, it's a chemical they add to make the teeth stronger. I I don't know. I um. I think every society has its own crimes and at different times, or every society, the, the, the injustice which is the foundation of every society eventually undermines that society in its own way. And the injustices that are the foundation of America are now erupting in, you know, in, in ways that are unique to America because that's the way America was founded. And, and whatever is erupting in Yugoslavia now is erupting because of a certain basic structural injustice there or a, a, a myth that has perpetuated some vision which is now you know, erupting. I mean, to me, the, the war, or the plague of violence is the result of something that might have, you know, something that's been there for a long time. I mean, that's, I don't know, that's, there are other questions and I could go on for a long time on this one, so. There are others that are related to that. We'll get to that later. I'd like to go back to the player. Uh, and first of all, a, a short question, because it was put to me and I could not give a very sufficient answer. What is a player? The writer obviously is not. Griffin Mill is. What yeah. is a player? A player is someone who, no matter how much he fails, will still be in the game and will always be able to uh, stay on the merry-go-round of Hollywood. Um, it's someone who has been accepted into, I don't want to say club, because that's, it's partly that, but someone who has been ex maybe accepted into the family or, you know, uh, it's actually this, uh, one of the things I was going to say before about differences between literature and, and, and film is that, uh, you know, writers make, novelists, people who aren't in the movies, make a, a side income and partly their reputations by, write, by reviewing each other's books and by nailing them and slamming them and, and, and criticizing them and insulting them. And people in the movies never publicly attack each other. And, and I think it's because in some way the movies is a kind of mafia. And the, uh, the money that you can make in the movies is the kind of money that you can make. People, unskilled people can make money in, in, in the movies and it's a kind of, I don't know, it's, it's too much. It's almost like gangster money. You know, it's like criminal money. You take all this, you know, you know, people, I mean, Steven Spielberg got a check for $150 million from Jurassic Park. And that's the figure that I heard, $125 million. And, and, and it's all in unit, from units of like $5 at a time, you know, it's an incredible, it's just like, you know, it's, 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 it's stealing, you know, you just think it's, it's sticky. So people, people want to keep themselves, they don't want to like, they don't want to criticize each other. They want to stay, there's a certain, the code of silence. And, and I think that's what, a player is someone who has managed to prove himself worthy of staying in the game. Mm -hmm. are, are you more a player now than you ever were? Or are you not a player at all? Well, the writers and directors, because they have to keep proving themselves at the box office, they have an objective standard by which they can be measured, um, are the last to be admitted. Studio executives, lawyers, and agents, 
um, who can ex who can take credit for things that other people were responsible for and blame people others for the things for, for yeah. the mistakes that they were responsible for are are it's easier for them to be in the game. As for myself, uh, I mean, I suspect right now I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> I mean, I, my new movie is a very difficult, weird film, uh, and I don't know if it's going to be very successful. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, you know, it, it's like with certainly within. Not everybody's going to give me a job, but I feel like right now I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, and it's objective. You know, I've had the other thing is that I've had, you know, five movies made, and and these days in Hollywood to have had five movies made. Whether they're successful or not means something. Plus, I got nominated for an Oscar and all that thing adds mm -hmm. up. I mean, all that adds up. Mm -hmm. I, I ask it because um, you have admitted in, in, in several interviews, to, or at least one, to having a sort of ambivalent uh, feeling about Hollywood. Uh, at, at one point it is, uh, I, I have some quotes that will also be, be written on your back over there in the labor camp or whatever you mentioned. Oh, well, the, <laughs> from the, uh, <laughs> the penal colony. Uh, it is a disgusting and evil place, uh, or not so much evil as irresponsible. The movies are deadening America, echoes of Ben Hack there, I think, who said the same thing. The Griffin Mills in our society are getting away with murder, and we have Hollywood to blame. But at the same time, you mention its generous side, because they give you people like you money to, to experiment. Yes. Uh, well, it's a complicated place. I, I mean, I think on, on the one hand, Hollywood is a kind of cultural Chernobyl. And on the other hand, we live in a society where people see hold, you know, at least in relationship to the movies, they're holding up big nets to catch the radiation. You know, they, they want it. I mean, you know, with the GATT talks coming and the, you know, Europe, the, the European film community trying to protect itself against Hollywood, and I'm, I'm basically all for national cinema, and, I, and, I, and I've been inspired too much by European cinema, and I know it's sort of embarrassing to turn on European TV and see American shows dubbed. Uh, I don't know, I was, I was in Paris last year, and I saw in, uh, Indecent Proposal, not in, yeah, I saw Indecent Proposal on, on, uh, in, in, in Fran you know, with a French audience, and those were locations that I know, stores that I know, <laughs> beaches that I know, and there was something sort of embarrassing about seeing everybody being exposed to this kind of tawdry little fantasy and 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 I at the same time it was full uh -huh. the theater was filled with french people and they were liking it and and you know coming from a, a culture which since i basically i don't know i mean since i basically believe that trade is a good thing and that uh, you know uh, markets are you know a necessary part of life um, or the free flow of ideas, you know, it's com it's a very complex, it's really very complicated. So it's poisoning and dumb numbing the American mind. But if they want to be poisoned and numbed, then well, I, that's, that's the problem. You know, I don't uh -huh. know because because being an American, it's very hard for me to to argue that that a, an elite should determine. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, I was just, I, I did a show, this, a TV show this afternoon, it's going to be on, I don't know, tonight. 15, tonight, and uh, part of it, they showed a videotape of a uh, production of a Georg Buchner play, and the theater company looked fantastic, and they'd taken over an old warehouse, and they dug trenches, and they put in bleachers, and it looked really great, and it was state-supported, and, and it was serious mm -hmm. art being supported by the state, and it's, you know, I mean, in America, there's, there's like, Steven Spielberg makes a lot more money in a month than America spends on art in a year. And, and I don't know what's right, but you've got a tradition here of, of elites, you know, of cultural elites, of aristocracies of one kind or another, which we don't have in America, and we got rid of it. And part of the price you pay when you get rid of an elite is that you know, you've got an economic democracy, with, and, and people are suspicious of the government saying, this is what you should look at. This is what we think is, is art. Um, I'd like to go back to the player. Um, one of the sub I mean, the player is about guilt, most um, pro predominantly, I would say. One of the sub themes is, about, is the treatment of the writer in Hollywood, mm. as I indicated in what I said at the beginning. Um, there's a 
there's a long tradition of the writer being the par do you pronounce it paria or pariah paria pariah pariah um, you remember Jack Warner, apart from saying they were schmucks Schmuck with Underwoods, Underwoods they, yeah. oh, they, I pay them, they do, uh, they do what I tell them. That yeah, was his. Right. Well, nevertheless, the, the greatest talents of uh, Anglo-American literature have at one point been employed there. Where does this lowly treatment of the writers stem from? Um, the respect that writers had before Hollywood was the respect that novelists had earned by the 19th century. Playwrights have always owned their, in, the, in America anyway, I think it's true for the world, though, the, the playwright is the, is the controller of the play. When people go see a play, they don't, they don't even know who the director is. It's the playwright's play. Mm -hmm. And the playwright has control. Hollywood in Hollywood, the writer came in late. There was no writer by, you know, the guys like me, you know. I mean, the, at first there were producers who, you know, maybe they bought a play or a book or they, you know, they got, you know, some people together and the director called out a story. Things were very simple and very stereotypical and really quite stupid. Um, a couple of geniuses came in and started making something of it. Um, the writers originally were, you know, there for adding subtitles, or they kind of groups of people worked in stories. The notion of one writer, one story, was never part of Hollywood, mm -hmm. and so the historical means of production, in you know, I mean, in, in sort of in the little way that I would ha understand how to apply Marx to this, the writer was not central, and since the writer wasn't central, he could never be central. Mm -hmm. And um, the writer has always, the screenplay has always been a group effort. I, I think also. And this is where I, I, I sort of have to part from the official line of the Writers Guild, and that is that as a director, I understand that it really is the director's medium because the movie, more so than a play, a play takes, you know, you want, we could take this little hall in here and we could rehearse a play, and this is the frame, and the director could take a script, work with the writer, make sure it worked, you know, and then. The play, and we could add costumes and add, you know, and add sets. But it all takes place in this frame, in this frame. And the time you have for rehearsal is a kind of luxury time. There's a certain flexibility to it because there's no extra cost for rehearsal. Once you've set the cost of the room, and I know this is economic and technical, but on a movie set, you know, an extra minute can suddenly cost you an extra twenty thousand dollars if you're going overtime, and you suddenly have to pay people for that new hour. So that you have to turn off the camera at a certain point unless you're willing to spend more money. And since you have to turn off the camera at a certain point, the director has to be able to choreograph enormously complicated things all at once. Mm -hmm. One of the things which has to be fluid in all of that is the screenplay. An actor says, no. Well, that's it. He says, no. Or the producer says, we can't afford it. Or the cameraman has been taking too long and the director says we're not going to be able to turn the camera around which means that we have to do it all over in that corner of the room now which means that thing that we were going to say no longer works which means we very quickly have to come up with a new line to explain what you're doing over there and you know the novelist has the novelist has the greatest luxury because he's working alone and when he's done he's done and if it takes three months if it takes ten years the work is his, and, and, and you haven't asked this question, but one of the, something I get asked sometimes, which is, what's the difference between screenwriting and novel writing novels and, and directing movies? And I would say that writing a novel and directing a movie, is the, they're much closer in in experience than than screenwriting to movies, because when you're writing a novel, you're really in control of things in the way that you're not when a, as a screenwriter. Screenwriter, a screenplay is not a finished product. A novel is a finished product, and a movie is a finished product. In the ego, I feel like I probably get better training as a director by writing a novel than I did as a screenwriter because the novel is an active, you know, is an active ego in the way that directing is an active ego, and the screenplay is an active submission. Yeah. Isn't it true that isn't it so that these great 
uh, authors who went to work in Hollywood. I mean, the, the examples are, are of you for Faulkner went to work, Ray Sherwood, Scott right. Fitzgerald. They all, I mean, as great a novelist as they were, they were all lousy screenwriters. Right. Isn't that because they uh, discovered too late that it's two separate crafts? They had contempt for it. Uh -huh. Although Faulkner wrote a couple, I mean, Faulkner with, um, with, the, with the Chandler, Faulkner yes. wrote a great script. Yeah. yeah. Um, Fitzgerald, you know, Fitzgerald's, what well, that college movie that he got the credit on is a bad film. Nathaniel know. West was a mediocre screenwriter. Um, I mean, really mediocre, just, you know, it's not, I, I saw some submarine movie that Nathaniel West wrote in. You know, there was, there was his name on the screen one night. Oh my God, this is it. I've never uh -huh. seen it before. <laughs> Here it is. And I turned it off 15 minutes later. It was embarrassing. Um, but I don't want you looking at Gleaming the Cube. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, is Joe Astor has right when he says that the writers bring this on to themselves because they are treated like they want to be treated like whores and consequently are treated like whores? They bring in a script, he says, and uh, while they hand the manuscript, they say. This is the script. Where do you want me to change it? <laughs> I don't think a whore is in 15 minutes and you're out. So I don't, I don't, <laughs> um, <laughs> so well, I don't know where that's Let's say, let's say a, a, a paid, la a kept lady. Yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, the mistress, I think. I, uh -huh. I think that, um, well, I think he's right, but I mean, I think he's right. I think that, that writers do approach it weakly, but I think writers also know it's very hard to really be a good, to get to be a good screenwriter. You know, I, I've been in Hollywood now for about 15 years, and I've watched a lot of careers, and, you know, there's always, every year, somebody comes in who's hot, sells a script for a lot of money, or gets a lot of work, and writes three or four script, you know, movies, and and maybe one more, somebody writes a movie and it's a big hit. And very few people are able to sustain. And, you know, when you go back and say, well, that, you know, it turns out that the movie that was a big hit was completely rewritten, for example. And that happens all the time and the other writers didn't get credit. Mm -hmm. It's very hard as a screenwriter to develop, the con to develop confidence. It's also very difficult as a screenwriter to get experience, to know what in you works and what doesn't, you know. Um, and when you are collaborating either by, you know, election, I mean, you, you, know, you, hire, you, you work with another writer, or whether you're, whether you're rewritten, you know, if ah, a friend of mine wrote a, a fairly successful comedy quite a few years, ago, like eight years ago, and she, everybody congratulated her on the, on the movie, and she was very like this, and she got sole credit on the film, I think she did. And, uh, and she, um, everybody quoted one line to her, and the line wasn't hers. And, you know, I mean, that happens with the player with me, you know, I, Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg, in the first scene she's in the movie, is, you know, my dialogue line for line, and the second scene with the tampon, she's, you know, off in another, off in another dimension. And, and it's difficult when you're looking at, at your own movie with your name on it, and, somebody, and people are laughing at a line that isn't yours. You know, you, you, have to be, you have to know that that's the process and you have to be willing to stay with it. And, and, I don't know. Last question about the, uh, about the player. Something, a question submitted by the audience about uh, where Robert Altman came in. I was all, also wondering, um, would the player, would it have been possible to make the player with another director than Robert Altman? I mean, would it, be a person uh, having the clout in Hollywood and the talents. It's possible that the player could have been made by another director. The player made about $25 million in America. Another director could have made that movie, that could have taken that script and with a different actor, could have made a movie that would have brought in $75 million and none of you would have cared about it. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been just a routine. I mean, that same plot could have been turned into a kind of, you know, a, not, we would have taken another writer on it too, but you know, we could have taken the plot and made it sexier and the relationship with the girlfriend and added more suspense and tension and 
gotten Richard Gere instead of Tim Robbins, you know, and given Michael Julia Douglas. Roberts the what? Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas, you know. Yeah, I mean, you make that. What does Hollywood <laughs> want from me? <laughs> you know, it's the movies, goddammit. You know, it's just, you know, everybody taking themselves very, very seriously. And it could have made a ton of money and, you know, would have disappeared. Nobody would have cared about it. So, so. I take it you're happy with all I think Altman all did a great job. Well, did he express interest in the, in the, uh, in the script or in the, in the novel even? No, he was... Well, Where did he, he come? He, uh, I wrote this novel, then I wrote the script, and then uh, my agent gave it to him and then we had a movie. And he was the first choice? God, no. <laughs> God, no, this guy, he was absolutely not. No, we had, who was our first choice? Um, Mark Rydell wanted to do it, then Sidney Lumet wanted to do it, and they weren't necessarily, I mean, <laughs> people wanted to do it. I mean, Robert Altman, when my agent said, Robert Altman wants to do this movie, we all said, oh, because he hadn't had a, you know, it's like, it had been about a thousand years since MASH, and, <laughs> and his movies along the way had all, died. And, and finally we said, you know, the wheel comes around and either, either, and all of us felt the movie will either be a disaster mm -hmm. or we'll go to the Academy Awards. It's going to be one or the other. And we really, I mean, from the beginning, we knew it was either going to be great or stupid. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, and it worked out. Yeah. Um, going back to the what did I say? Moral landscape? Cultural landscape? Cultural landscape. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the moral landscape. Griffin Mill is uh, uh, mortally afraid of failure. He, he, he hates losers. He's, he's uh, preoccupied with signals of losing and of failure. And Frank Gale is, in a sense, uh, a person whose failure closes up on him. He's, um, is failure a, a major scare in America. It's a great subject. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. In a word, yes. <laughs> I don't if think I I'm, go any further, I don't answer, <laughs> we, we'll I'll fail be. at the answer. Uh, I, I think that failure is... Um, <laughs> it's, it's, failure is... Um, the, uh, what's the word, it's the, it's the forbidden topic in America, mm -hmm. because people view it as contagious. Nobody, yes. you know, I have, one, of my, one of my friends says, you know, sometimes people get kind of mildew on them, and you don't want to be close to them because it's going to rub off, you know, you, you see somebody around town and he's wearing last year's jacket. He's, he said, you know, people get kind of shiny. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, it's last year's jacket. It's beginning to shine. And um, in, in the New Age, which is completely about failure, that's the whole movie is about failure. Well, you know, even reading the script. And, and there's a line where Judy Davis is, and Peter Weller run a, uh, uh, open up a boutique, an expensive clothing boutique, and it's not, it's dying. It's just dying. And an old friend of Judy's runs by, is walking by the store, and Judy runs out and says, I haven't seen you in a year. How are you? And she said, well, where have you been? She said, well, I went to Bali. It was, oh, it was $5,000 just to get there. And, but the, you know, and the, when you're on the beach, it's, uh, you know, the massages are $3 and you wake up feeling reborn. It's the most spiritual place I've ever seen. And, and Judy Davis says, well, you, you should have come into the store before you left. We have some you know, beautiful, sarcastic resort dresses. And she said, well, another time. And she said, well, and then and she, and she's with her friend. The other the woman's with her friend. And, and she says, well, you're coming to the party tonight, aren't you? And Judy says, party? What party? And then Anna says, well, look, I mean, you know, I ha it, it, I, we, you know, I, we can't invite you. It, it's other people's problems. They make us nervous. I have to be honest. <laughs> and then she walks away. <laughs> uh, you should see Dr. Ozeal for marriage therapy. You know? <laughs> I remember the first time when I, when I, when I encountered this phenomenon, it was in 1972 during the Nixon-McGovern uh, elections. And I asked, asked the proverbial taxi driver, who are you going to vote for? Nixon. I said, why are you not going to vote for McGovern? Oh, he's a loser. He's going to lose. Right. Nothing about what he stood for. Nothing right. about... That's, uh, right. that's a strange phenomenon. 
<laughs> um, you want to talk about Camus? You can. I don't know him well enough. I've only read, I mean, it's getting into, well, people here are sophisticated and they know li European literature. I'll, I'll, well, you know. I'll fail. Um, his I'm name was mentioned in, a, in relation to the play, but is it not more um, apt to, to mention his name in relationship with, the, uh, with Among the Dead? I, I could, you could see, say that Gale is like the stranger um, confronted with an interpretation of reality that bewilders him. He, he is, in a sense, you could say that Frank Gale is the ultimate stranger in, the, in these, the, yes. in these surroundings. Um, should I take that now? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the, there's a French critic named René Girard. Has anybody read him? I don't know if he's known here. He left France and has taught in America for about 25 years. And he's written a series of books. The titles are Violence and the Sacred, The Scapegoat. Um, he was a you know, typical French literary theorist whose study of literature led him to a study of religion. And I was reading him obsessively. He's very interested in, in, in what he calls the scapegoat mechanism and victimization mm -hmm. as, as, a, as, a, as a syndrome. And he talks about Camus a lot. He talks about the stranger and talks about the plague. He's very interested in images of plague in, in literature and the plague as violence, you know, I mean, the opening of the Iliad is, you know, a discussion of the plague. And, and any time he, he finds plague metaphors or, or cities under plague, there's always some, there are these forms, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it will, it's too complicated for me to uh, explain under the circumstances. And um, I just, it's, I don't really understand it fully. It's more something that I have a sort of an intuitive grasp of. But Frank is a scapegoat. His refusal to join the society, represented in the novel by two lawsuits that are being filed against the airlines. He refuses to join, or he, he, he cannot decide, he cannot choose between which lawyer he should go with. And everybody who is entitled to sue the airlines has chosen one or another of these lawyers. And they're pretty much divided evenly down the middle. And they have these very sort of ritualistic battles back and forth. You know, the people who have signed with one lawyer are mad at the people who have gone with the other because they each think that the other lawyer is going to screw up their case. Frank refuses to join either any lawsuit and then everybody gangs up on him. And... Um, Even the lawyers threaten him with a case against him. The lawyers threaten him with a lawsuit for not suing. <laughs> <laughs> That's America. <laughs> um, a, a, a very a little question that I that intrigues me a lot. You you have Frank Gale in in his bewilderment. He does a lot of bewildering things like shitting his pants and things yeah. like that, um, which we all, I mean, we forgive him for everything he does and says. Of Thank course. you. Uh, he calls the sister of the man who shoots down the plane. Yes. I was going to read that scene, but I, I was running out of time. And he identifies himself as Larry Levy, who is the, uh, the man that Griffin Mill is scared right. of taking his plane. Right, right. Is, is it more than a joke? It's a joke. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I think it's, it's I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I've actually thought about, I've thought about trying to do this more of, of keeping characters alive from one thing to the next mm -hmm. in a small way or in a big way because I'm interested in seeing what would happen if I did that seriously and not as a joke. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily linking the novels as one vast tapestry about California, but as a way of taking the life from one book and seeing what happens when I introduce that into oh, yeah, something yeah. else. Mm -hmm. Again, it's for, you, know, you look at paintings. I mean, painters are always dealing with, you know, so many painters deal with a form. They invert it, they turn it around, they play or colors or ideas. And I, I just wanted to bring that notion into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also thought it was a hoot. <laughs> it seemed yeah. like Larry Levy is... A, is 
the character Larry Levy's on the plane, which goes down in San Diego. And, you know, I just... He's I, one of the victims. He's, he's one, one of the victims of on the plane. He, he, he literally dies. Larry Levy dies. So you cannot use him in the next novel? No. No, but if I write another novel about Griffin Mill, which <laughs> I thought about doing, Griffin will have to talk about the terrible death of Larry Levy when he died in the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And how, you know... You know, people suspected Griffin. Bring, people used to make jokes about Griffin shooting down the plane. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned somewhere that you were influenced uh, somewhere along the line by reading the uh, Frankfurter Schule, uh, yes. especially Adorno yes. and his theory of compartmentalization. Did I say that right? Compartmentalization. Griffin Mill is. Um, she's American. That's why I'm. No, I know. Keep checking with her. <laughs> I could check with you, of course. That's all right. No, I asked <laughs> Megan, it's fine. Um, people like Griffin Mill, they are able to compartmentalize uh, guilt from uh, consciousness, their the actions from conscience. Isn't, in a sense, a Frank Gale somebody who, in all his ordinariness, uh, is unable and uh, st stands out? Because he's unable to compartmentalize grief from his his actions, Frank Gale. Yes. Yes, I think that Frank is a is the only whole person in the book, because he's the only one who is suffering. He's the one who's suffering the most, mm -hmm. because he's the only one who does not suffer according to the plan. That Beltran, with his list of you know one grief. To reject that those, you know, I mean, if you, it's one of the points that's made in the book, you know, because 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 Frank is out of out of sync. He is not suffering. He is not progressed to the next appropriate level of grief. Someone says, well, you know, you've skipped one, and you really have to go through them. Mm -hmm. You know that that in the end he becomes a target because he is not appropriate anymore, and and. What drives him crazy is his inability to find a community for the way he is actually feeling. You know, the hardest thing in, in I don't you know, I think one of the one of the really hard things, and it's a, in our in my culture is is or probably in any culture, is the ability to be able to share what you're really going through with somebody else. And where I think we feel lonely is where we imagine that we're the only ones feeling this. Or if I express this to somebody else, I'm going to be mocked, you know, mocked or ridiculed or attacked. Or, or you know, I'm not going to, you know, somebody, or, or I think attacked for my feelings. Yes, I'm not going to find a sympathetic ear. And so you're, you know, you're thrown into yourself. It's a, mo I mean, in a way, it's a sort of maudlin thought. And, and, but at the same time, it's true, you know, it's what drives us crazy. Mm -hmm. Have we got enough time left? Well, depends on the audience. Oh, well. I, they can leave if they want. It's not snowing any longer. Uh, I will, because I, was, uh, I, I have loads of questions here, but maybe somebody would like to tie in a question to what has been said so far. We don't have... Yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, because the uh, uh, producer called me. I one of the reasons I wrote the player as a screenplay was that I trusted the producer who asked me to do it, because he made a deal with me that would have meant that if the would have meant some you know a significant amount of money. Um, the company went bankrupt, but if things had been done a little bit better, um, you know, I mean, I could have, I could have, made, I could have made some money off of the film more than I did. And uh, I'm talking about money because that's, you know, because Norman Mailer said this great thing. He said that your bad motives are as important as your good motives. And one of the things in thinking about the careers of any writer is that sometimes the need for money is a real motive. And I had two reasons for writing the script. I had nothing better in my mind at the time, and I felt sort of defeated by that, that I really wanted to do, I had another idea, 
and I couldn't get it down. I had started Among the Dead, but I wasn't able to. I had the first few chapters, but I didn't know how to go beyond them. And this producer called and said, look, if you do this this way, he didn't offer me any money up front, but he says, if you write the script and we get the movie made, I promise you that we'll, you'll get you know, some real money for it. And, and I needed the money. And the terms that he set for me made me take the gamble of adapting the book, knowing that if, I, you know, if, it, if it failed, it was going to sting, but if it succeeded, you know, it was going to work out all right. If I had been really mo working well on something else, I might have turned him down, or I might have let, I might have sold it to him for real money, and let another writer take it. Anybody else? Put it the two. Question about uh, among the dead. It's something I kept questioning myself: is Why Anna Frank's wife took the letter with her on the plane? I just don't understand. <laughs> You know how people return to something obsessively? They can't let it go. Yeah. You know, they just want to... I had a girlfriend once and a boyfriend had dumped her. Was breaking up with her. And I didn't know that until I found the letter in her handbag. It had been a long time, but she still carried the letter. Yeah. You know, it was just, I guess you had to keep reading it over and over again. Um, also, if she had thrown the letter away, I wouldn't have had half of the book. <laughs> For, so yeah. she had to have the letter. And I thought about that. I mean, I really wrestled with it, and I thought, well, you know, she just carries it, you know. It's, mm -hmm. it's there. Right. No, that's not stated. The handbag. No, it's, no, it was no. in the suitcase. No, 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 no. no. It was in the suitcase. Because when it's because the letter is I don't think I say exactly how it's discovered. No, because it, we, found it's among the. Well, then they find they open because everything is opened up and they go through the belongings and then they found the letter. No, 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 no. They find the letter in the suitcase. You know, they just go through the belongings because it's a, because the plane was because the plane was blown up and they have to you know they have to look for what they plane is there. Whew, got out of that. <laughs> Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> that was close, huh? Boy, yeah. <laughs> if that had been a problem, my translators are here, I could have faxed them an extra chapter. <laughs> well, quick, somebody found out what's wrong. Let's clear it up in Dutch. <laughs> and, you know, I gave it a happy ending in Spanish. There's other things. <laughs> one more question, because we've been going on. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, one more, then I have... Would you, and it's a poem in Urdu. I, I, I played with it. If it's going to be one more question, would you like a question about movies? I don't know. Take blindly. Just, just uh, reach in. Let's be. Let's just choose by lots. Do you like European films better? You did not say that you didn't. That you don't like American films. Well, do you if like? If I you had to take to a desert island, mm -hmm. one continent cinema, I would probably take this continent cinema if I was limited to one. I mean, I, I, just, I put together a list of my ten favorite films for uh, film comment. The mention them, film please. Sound. Mention them, please. What? Mention them, please. I can't remember exactly because it changes. Animal House was the first one because I said every list needs a good sick comedy. <laughs> Part of it was like a defense. So I knew that everybody would have Citizen Kane on it. And I thought, you know, <laughs> you know not me. If I, I said, I, what I said was, if I said, I don't want to get into a conversation at a party with anybody who's got these lists of movies on their films anyway. So, Animal House, Stage, no, not Stagecoach, um, My Darling Clementine. And I said, My Darling Clementine, because I said, it's got um, Victor Mature in it. And he said, Shakespeare and Doom, so. Um, a great line. Godard, Sauve qui You know that film? Great movie. Um, Berlin Alexander Flack. Um, Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep. You ever seen that film? Oh. <laughs> great movie. Um, Les Clis. The, uh, is that how you say it? The, the, um, the Eclipse. Oh, the Eclipse, yeah. The, the, uh, Antonioni. Antonioni. Yeah. Um, because I said there's this scene where, um, what's her name there? Monica Vitti. Monica Vitti dances like an African. 
I met Monica Vitti at Ken two years ago, and I'm not that starstruck. I mean, I'm a little bit, you know. It's hard not to be. But I met her, I, so I told somebody, God, I'm just, you know, we're talking about this film. And I said, well, Vitti is here. You've got to meet her. So, oh, yeah, well, you know. And I got to this hotel, and there she was framed by the Mediterranean. You know, the, the, she was sitting, she was perfectly dressed, and there was the Mediterranean was over her shoulders, and I was just... And I started acting out scenes from her movies because I, I, I was watching a lot of Antonioni at the time. And um, that was really great. Um, <laughs> books don't do the same, you know. It's one of the... It's a difference between literature and film, you know. It's... Uh, somehow, seeing Norman Mailer framed with the East River behind him is not the same. And it's, you know, I don't know. He, didn't, he wouldn't look as good in that dress that she was wearing. Um... <laughs> Uh, what else was on the list? Um, the Wizard of Oz. Is I think it's a really great movie. Um, that's like seven or eight. Um, I don't know, a couple of others. Uh -huh. You know, a few, maybe a few more American films. Thanks very much. Those of you whose questions have not been mentioned, you try to follow him to his hotel or the, or, or the bar where he. Can I say something? Yes, of course. I, I, this was really fun. I. Um, I gave it. I've, I, I'm nervous about talking I, I, because I, I sometimes I can get very hostile. I uh, hate talking to writers, writers groups, because in America, whenever I talk to a writers group, and I, I try to be interesting, and I show film clips, and, I, and I've done this a couple of times. And it's like I talked to a group of people at, in LA a couple of weeks ago about movies, and I showed them four clips to talk about character. And the first question was, well, when you write a script, how do you make an outline on three by five cards? Or, what? <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and then the next question was, well, well, and then I, and then, and then I talked a little more about character. And then, and then the next question was, yeah, what? Well, what do you do for inspiration? <laughs> no. And, and, and then I, I spoke to a, a group of film students uh, who were getting paid a, a $21,000 a year by Universal Pictures to look at movies and meet writers and to write under supervision. And I asked them, you know, went to talk to this group, people in their 30s, 20s and 30s, what movies they had seen. And I had a list of movies that I liked. A Shampoo, I think, was one of my, was one of my ten. And, and they hadn't seen them. And, I, and at that point, the fangs came out. And I said, you're getting paid $21,000 a year, and you haven't seen Shampoo, and you haven't seen this movie, and you haven't seen that movie. And I got really angry. And it's really a pleasure just to be able to... To uh, not to be asked, you know, the outline question. It's worth coming here. Anyway, thank you very much. This is really great. Thank you. Thank you.